on this Saturday of the second week in Lent, epistles from the book of Genesis. In those days, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard thy father talking with Esau, thy brother, and saying to him, Bring me of the hunting, of thy hunting, and make me meats that I may eat, and bless thee in the sight of the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, follow my counsel, and go thy way to the flock. Bring me two kids of the best, that I may make of them meat for thy father, such as he gladly eateth, which when thou hast brought in, and hath eaten, eaten, he may bless thee before he die. But he answers, answered her, Thou knowest that Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am smooth. If my father shall feel me and perceive it, I feel lest he will think, I fear lest he will think I would have mocked him, and shall bring upon me a curse instead of a blessing. And his mother said to him, Upon me be this curse, my son. Only hear thou my voice, and go fetch me the things which I said. He went and brought and gave them to his mother. She dressed meats such as she knew his father liked, and she put on him very good garments of Esau, which she had at home with her, and the, little, and the little skins of the kids she put about his hands, and covered the bear of his neck. And she gave him the savior meat, and delivered him bread that she had baked, which when he had carried in, he said, My father, but he answered, I hear, who art thou, my son? And Jacob said, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done as thou didst command me. Arise, sit, and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said to his son, How couldst thou find it so quickly, my son? He answered, It was the will of God that what I sought came quickly in my way. And Isaac said, Come hither, that I may feel thee, my son, and may prove whether thou be my son Esau or not. He came near to his father, and when he had felt him, Isaac said, The voice indeed is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. But And he knew him not, because his hairy, hairy hands made him like to the elder. Then blessing him, he said, Art thou my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, Bring me the meats of thy hunting, my son, that my soul may bless thee. And when they were brought, he had, and had, he had eaten, he offered him wine also, which after he had drunk, he said to him, Come near me and give me a kiss, my son. He came near and kissed him, and immediately he smelled the fragrant smell of his garments, Blessing him, he said, Behold, the smell of my son is as the smell of a plentiful field, which the Lord hath blessed. God give thee of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth, abundance of corn and wine, and let people serve thee and tribes worship thee. Be thou Lord of thy brethren, and let thy mother's children bow down before thee. Cursed be he that cursed thee, and let him that bless, blessed thee be filled with blessings. Isaac had scarce ended his words when Jacob be now gone out abroad. Esau came and brought in to his father meats made of what he had taken in hunting, saying, Arise, my father, and eat of thy son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said to him, Why? Who art thou? He answered, I am thy firstborn son, Esau. Isaac was struck with fear and astonished exceedingly and wondered beyond what can be believed and said, Who is he then that even now brought me venison that he had taken and I ate of all before thy camest? And I blessed him and he shall be blessed. Esau, having heard his father's words, roared out with a great cry, and being in great consternation, said, Bless me also, my father. And he said, Thy brother came deceitfully, and got thy blessing. But he said again, right, Rightly is his name called Jacob, for he hath supplanted me, lo, this second time. My first birthright he took away before, and now this second time he hath stolen away my blessing. 
And again he said to his father, Hast thou not preserved me also a blessing? Isaac answered, I appointed him thy Lord, and have made all his brethren his servants. I have established him with corn and wine, and after this, what shall I do more for thee, my son? And Esau said to him, Hast thou, hast thou only one blessing, father? I beseech thee, bless me also. And when he wept with a loud cry, Isaac, being moved, said to him, In the fat of the earth and in the dew of heaven above shall thy blessing be. The continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and scribes this parable. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of substance that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his substance. And not many days after, the younger son, gathering all together, went abroad into a far country, and there wasted his substance, living righteously. And after he had spent all, there came a mighty famine in that country, and he began to be in want. And he went and cleaved to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his farm to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And returning to himself, he said, How many hired servants in my father's house abound with bread, and I here perish with hunger? I will arise and will go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am not worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And rising up, he came to his father. And when he was a yet a great way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. And running to him, fell upon his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm not now worthy to be called thy son. And the father said to his servants, Bring forth quickly the first robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and make merry because this my son was dead and he has come to life again was lost and is found and they began to be merry now his elder son was in the field and when he came and drew nigh to the house he heard music and dancing and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath re received him safe. And he was angry, and would not go in. His father therefore coming out began to entreat him. And he answering said to his father, Behold, for so many years did I serve thee, and have, I have never transgressed thy commandment, and yet thou hast never given me a kid to make merry with my friends. But as soon as thy son has come and hath devoured his substance with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. But he said to him, Son, thou art always with me, and all I have is thine. But it was fit that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and is found. And in Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, Amen. O Maria, gracia plena domus tecum, benedicta turingus, e benedictus fructus ventris tu Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostri. Amen. In this Saturday, in the second week in Lent, we heard in today's Gospel, our Lord Jesus Christ tells the parable of the prodigal son. And at the end of the Gospel, we hear them celebrating 
The Return of the Sun by Music and Dancing. So today's sermon will talk about the morality of music. The early fathers of the church were exceedingly critical of their contemporary musical situation for various reasons of morals and religion. Many of the church fathers had spoken against the music of their times because it was essentially either idolatrous or licentious. Music of the theater was but an extension of the pagan cults and consequently for them to speak out against such immoral music was a, power, was a powerful way indirectly to uphold the true faith of Christ among the Catholic faithful. The Catholic faithful were still at that time still filled and influenced with the dregs of their own, their old sinful ways, such as sexually simulating marriage parties, or singing to their pagan gods in their own homes, or on occasion of pagan festivals celebrating with their non-Christian neighbors. On the other hand, the church fathers gave eloquent words and praises for the new song in the early church, namely the chant of the liturgy, which leads one to the Christian virtues of patience, kindness, peace, joy, and charity, bringing the faithful together in ardent and humble worship of the one true God, the most holy trinity. Now in general, past civilizations have held that good music disposes man to virtue whereas bad music disposes man to vice. In the sixth, in the sixth century, the, the Catholic philosopher, Anisius Bothius, wrote the following, quote, music can both establish and destroy morality. For no path is more open to the soul for the formation thereof than through the ears. Therefore, when the rhythms and modes have penetrated even to the soul through these organs, it cannot be doubted that they affect the soul with their own character and conform it to themselves." End of quote. As the Catholic writer Father Basil Nortz explains, both the use attested to the awareness that ancient peoples had about the influence of music. So great was the regard for music among them that they looked on it as a having a definite power over the soul. Now these men are, are cited in order to convey a sense of the gravity of this topic. It concerns not only our own personal human growth and progress towards holiness, but also the very survival of our civilization. Inasmuch as the civilized public order of man depends upon a culture which seeks to perfect the private order of individuals, there is scarcely any more effective means of disrupting civilization than through a degenerate music which inordinately stimulates the passions, give them, give them, them free dominion, a variable tyranny of avarice and sensuality. The philosophers mentioned and past civilizations in general have held that good music disposes man to virtue, whereas bad music disposes man to vice. The music generally accepted by a civilization will profoundly determine its moral health and ultimately its growth or demise. Now it's important to note that these philosophers did not say that music produces virtue or vice but rather disposes one for the acquisition of one or the other. As one writer puts it, music can only suggest, encourage with its delights, not force anyone to act contrary to their best convictions, yet many suggestions can undermine felt and reasoned convictions over a prolonged period of time. Moreover, the free choice to expose oneself to one form of music or another, especially repeatedly and over a prolonged period of time, is a moral choice itself. That is, this very choice is either virtuous or sinful. 
But the question is, why does music have a strong influence in disposing man to virtue or to vice? To put it briefly, music as an art form is unique with regard to the object that it imitates. There's an axiom in philosophy which states, art imitates nature. Every, few, every form of human art must take from the created order elements that it imitates and arranges so as to articulate a feeling or conviction which the artist wishes to express to his fellow man. As such, they have an effect on man. Now, what does music imitate? It is capable of imitating various things in our experience, such as the sound of a blustery storm, or the rushing of troops into battle, or the hectic bedlam of rush hour traffic. But the motion of musical sounds expressed in various types of melody, harmony, rhythm, and tonal texture most importantly are capable of imitating man's own inner passions or emotions. There are certain natural bodily motions which commonly accompany man's feelings of joy, anger, hope, sorrow, fear, despair, love, hate, and courage. Music is capable of imitating these same movements and so invoke these feelings in the soul. In this way, music is a natural and universal language which is not learned, but immediately and connaturally felt. It is true that we can learn to associate certain memories and feelings with certain kinds of music due to repeated experiences. Nevertheless, for the most part, music, by its very melody, harmony, rhythm, and so on, expresses, expresses specific emotions. For example, there is no need to teach a little child this is happy music or this is sad music, because as soon as the happy music is played to the child, the child begins to move joyfully. Whereas sad music is, when it's sad music is played, we got a different reaction. It is true that the other arts also work upon man's emotions. Take, for example, a statue such as Michelangelo's Pieta, which imitates a scene of Mary holding her dead son Jesus. The statue arouses pity, compassion, and sadness because it depicts the Blessed Mother in the state of the, these emotions. Hence, those devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary are easily moved, whereas non-Catholics re may remain untouched. Now, music is different because it does not portray others experiencing the emotion, but it rather directly imitates and so stimulates the emotions themselves. That is why music can be categorized according to the passion it imitates and arouses. There is joyful music, sad music, suspenseful music, rebellious music, and so on. A person would not usually confuse, for, for example, Gregorian chant music with a marching song, nor would they mistake music to celebrate victory with a funeral hymn. The differences, are, the differences are very obvious. And this is because even without there being lyrics to identify the feeling the composer wishes to arouse, the feeling is aroused by itself, by the hymn, or the, the rhythm and melody. This point is of utmost importance. Music consists neither essentially nor primarily in the lyrics, that is, the words of the song. Whether a piece of music has words or not is accidental to the music itself, insofar as it imitates and affects the passions. For example, we do not need to understand German to know that the fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is an ode to joy. The joy is felt, not intellectualized. 
But what, is, what does all this have to do with disposing man to virtue or to vice? The connection between music and the formation of virtue becomes clear when we realize that the two carnal virtues of fortitude and temperance and the many other related virtues are primarily concerned with the ordering of our passions or emotions according to the right reason. These virtues perfect our emotions so that we take delight in what is truly good and avoid what is truly evil. They increase our capacity to, to love truly and well and unify our strength to oppose and overcome evil. They are the strongholds of man's character. We're talking about virtues like chastity, sobriety, temperance, meekness, patience, clemency, courage, humility, and many others. On the opposite side, there are the vices of drunkenness, lust, infidelity, harshness, cruelty, jealousy, and many other ugly beasts. The passions of our soul, which are love and hate, desire and aversion, joy and sadness, hope and fear, audacity and anger and despair will all be formed either by virtue in accord with right reason or by brute passion in vice. In order to acquire these moral virtues which beautify the soul by ordering the passions, man must habit man must habituate his emotions to act in accord, in accord with right reason. And this is what the ancients meant when they said that good music fosters virtue, while bad music fosters vice. Music as an art form moves man to delight in the emotions and passions which the music evoke, evokes. And repeated listening to a certain kind of music becomes habitual in the strictest sense of the word. The emotions clothe themselves with a habit, either virtue or vice, according to the quality of the music one habitually listens to. In this regard, Aristotle wrote the following. He said, emotions of any kind are produced by melody and rhythm. Therefore, by music, a man becomes accustomed to feeling the right emotions. Music has thus the power to form character, and various kinds of music based on the various modes may be distinguished by their effects on character. For example, one working in the direction of melancholy, another of effeminacy, one encouraging abandonment, another self-control, another enthusiasm, and so on through the series. And a quote from Aristotle. Music can imitate a reasonable, ordered, honorable, virtuous emotion in which music helps to dispose man to the virtuous and honorable ordering of his life. However, music can also imitate an unreasonable, disordered, dishonorable, vicious emotion. The old saying that music calms the savage beast may be true of old music, but it would hardly be hold true for many forms of modern music, which, whose purpose often is to release the beast. We know in the Old Testament, when King Saul was troubled by an evil spirit, he was calmed and delivered from it by David playing the harp. Should David have played upon the war drums, or had he sounded the battle horns for attack, one could hardly expect Saul to have been calmed down and brought back to his senses by such music. Is there, is there any serious doubt in the mind concerning the category into which the modern electrified instruments would fall in today's world, especially the electric guitars? Many people think that the goodness or badness of music can be judged simply by its lyrics. But this is false. It cannot be doubted that the lyrics themselves may be good or bad. Bad lyrics certainly magnify the wickedness of bad music and also poison 
sometimes good music. For example, if a composer writes a very solemn, beautiful hymn and puts and puts to that beautiful hymn blasphemous words to it, great would be the perversion. So also the composer wrote a piece of music which inspired great fortitude, accompanied it with a with, with lyric which called for the annihilation of a particular race or class of people, this obviously would be an evil song. For this reason, if the words are bad, then the music is especially to be avoided regardless of whether a person listens or pays active attention to the words, because the human mind is influenced nevertheless. But the point of our present argument is that the medium is the message. In other words, the music, its melody, harmony, and rhythm, all by itself, disposes man either to virtue or to vice by moving the emotions. Therefore, the way in which they move the passions should serve as a principal basis for judgment on whether any given piece of music is good or bad. It's unfortunate in today's Catholic world, <clears throat> unfortunate mistake to think that only the moral formation of consists only in simply teaching children the Ten Commandments. Such instruction provides good and important intellectual formation, but is not moral, total moral formation. Moral formation is the formation of the will and the emotions accustomed, accustoming them to delight in their proper objects. How can we teach our passions to rejoice in accord with right reason? Music is one of the most powerful means. This is what Plato meant when he wrote in the Republic, quote, musical training is a more potent instrument than any other because rhythm and harmony find their way into the inward places of the soul, end of quote. There exists a large assortment of good music Nevertheless, the principles of judgment concerning good or, and bad music cannot be possibly reduced to a mere matter of personal taste and preference, any more than moral virtues are a matter of personal taste. Nevertheless, just as we can indicate several norms of virtuous behavior based upon the proper ordering of the passions to right reason, so too we can indicate general norms for good music based upon whether the passions imitated are according to right reason or not. In a word, good music will stimulate the emotions in such a way that these faculties of the soul, under the guidance of reason, are made to, to, move, are made to more effectively pursue the good of the individual and his neighbor. Bad music tends to absolutize the passions, making their pleasure to hate a good in itself, such that right reason, more or less, sorry, more and more, loses dominion with the result that the individual falls victim to the passions. Hence, it is not perchance that disordered music naturally leads to decadence, rebellion, and chaos. The rock and roll in 1955 has since spawned a large prodigy such as heavy metal, rap, punk, pop, and so on. The common element in most of these, if not all, is a throbbing, heavy, pulsating beat and sync syncopated rhythm, which are amplified through the electrification of instruments, especially the, the guitar. The lyrics which accompany such much of this secular music are similarly often immoral and even satanic. But the fact of the matter is that such lyrics fit the music perfectly. Very often the music itself is obscene even without the lyrics. Emotions invoked by such music can hardly be considered virtuous, much less Christian. The passions of, passions of sensuality, rebellion, pride, power, and irreverence are commonly evoked by the rhythms characteristic of these types of music. And this includes Christian rock or Christian pop music. Apart from the emotional effects that the prodigy rock music has on man, there are also ver verifiable physiological effects, such as the increase of adrenaline in the bloodstream, 
which makes the music physically addictive. Also, it causes the outpouring of sexual hormones when the volume of music is high, which is particularly the norm, especially in concerts. These physical re repercussions also serve as indicators of the effect that this music can have on the moral life. Since the moral virtues of temperance and fortitude do not reside in man's purely spiritual faculties of intellect and will, but in the passions of, of his soul, they are more easily dis disturbed by such bodily changes. By contrast, let us now consider the musical antithesis of rock music, that is, chant. Here we note that the emotions are being, st being stimulated in a very different way, not in a riot of passion, but peacefully in a way that serves reason and respects the integrity of the individual. Plain chant, especially Gregorian chant, has been preferred for sacred worship in the church and even before Christ in the Jewish praying of the Psalms. Such is the case <clears throat> not simply because it so perfectly serves to convey the meaning of the text, but because chant music itself conveys a sense of peace, reverence, purity, and humility. The point is not that chant music is the only good music, nor that all good music is, only, is like chant, except that an all good music stimulates emotions in a way consonant with reason. For example, the Baroque, peri the Baroque period, the classical period, offers very fine pieces of such music, along with traditional Catholic hymns on the Blessed Virgin Mary, Christmas, and Easter. Good music touches the soul delightfully and elevates it nobly, whereas bad music corrupts the soul as profoundly as air corrupts the mind. Because just as the mind should, be, should not be enslaved by, un, by untruth, so too the soul should not be enslaved by tireless passion. It is so very important to realize that it's not simply the lyrics or the words that will affect man, but the music melody itself enters in the deepest recesses of the soul to influence, influence man even more profoundly. Words may, must first be understood by the mind, but music, melody, and harmony, and rhythm is immediately grasped by the emotions. It seems a great paradox that this hour in history, which enjoys an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented accessibility of music, should suffer from a correspondingly unprecedented ignorance or denial of the incredible power and influence that music has on the moral formation of man. However, agreement is found in this. Both the producers of bad music and the commercial empire that uses it for its purposes both want to man manipulate man through his passions. It was to such music that Israel sacrilegiously celebrated before the golden calf of avarice and debauchery while Moses was on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, which so perfectly articulate right reason. That he shattered the tablets of, of the law in his righteous indignation made manifest what Israel was doing with its debauched music before the golden calf. The incident is both historical and perennially true. As one author puts it, possibly the greatest weakness of the modern materialistic outlook upon the world is its inability to perceive the causes behind effects. If anywhere, it is here that the ancient philosophers deserve our fullest respect, since it could be said that they, real, they specialized in seeing to the cause and the core of things. And they most certainly would have agreed with Thoreau that music can destroy civilization. The ancients may yet have a thing or two to teach us which bear upon the survival of Western civilization if only we have the humility to learn. Immoral music is everywhere nowadays, even in the ringtone of all cell phones. Therefore, the, for the greater glory of God and salvation of souls, let us teach others the dangers of immoral music. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.